Well, today I'm delighted to be joined by Ross Metcalf, who has been part of our community here at AUC for a number of years now, in two different stints, one going way back and uh, one the second in more, more recent years. And for those of you who know Ross, he's a wonderful raconteur, and so I'm very much looking forward to hearing some of uh, the journey of his life and uh, the various transitions which have been you know, between the UK and South Africa. And so welcome, Ross. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for joining us today. So Ross, take us back to the start. Where were you born? And uh, tell us you know, a little bit about your family and your, your background, I think, in the UK. Yeah, well, I started off as a real Tom. Okay. And yeah, brought up in the UK, post-war, Second World War, with rationing and so on. Lived in a beautiful little village. I was an incredibly um, a privileged child because, although I didn't appreciate it at the time, I was living in a country area and doing what I wanted to do. So just tell us about your, your parents and, were you, and your siblings and, and where were you born? Yeah, I'm um, born in Farnborough uh, in the middle of an air raid and my mother had to be moved um, very rapidly because a bomb exploded outside uh, the, uh, the hospital she was due to go to. Farnborough and is in Surrey, I think, am I correct? In Surrey? Is Farnborough in Surrey? Yes, yeah. it's in, well, it's, it's actually in Hampshire, so it's south of Surrey, mm. though more to the south end of the United Kingdom. Yes. And um, so that's when I knew very little about what was going on by then. And um, then uh, the first memories I had were moving to a beautiful little village called Chalfant St Giles in Buckinghamshire, which was quite close to London. And then picking up with friends and roaming the woods and so on. Um, and the most important thing was to have a catapult or an air gun or something like that, um, just to play with all the time. And uh, although food was a bit short and sweets were a luxury, I think we were very, very privileged, had a marvellous time. So your parents, uh, your father was working, and how many siblings, and where are you in the in the food chain and family. Okay, I, my mother, bless her, was um, managed to bring up myself and my sister, and uh, so we were about three years apart. I was the elder brother, yeah. and my father worked in aircraft mainly. Okay, which sounds like you're a, a classic uh, child of a, a wartime Britain, by the sound of father working in aircraft. Yeah. Uh, and did that sort of shape your, your, your childhood, that, that environment? Yeah, it did in a way. I was always, re my father was always regaling me with stories of the farm that he lived on in Yorkshire. He was uh -huh. a Yorkshire boy. And I wanted to be a vet for quite a long time. In fact, I, in spirit, I, I love animals and they enjoy uh, walking my dog is, is a pleasure for me. So that I enjoyed, and then, of course, I had to do this terrible thing called schooling. Mm. I had to go to school, which... So Sunday nights were a bad time in my life. <laughs> and Friday afternoon was a time of joy. So why didn't you like school? <laughs> because it was school, I think. Um, I became a school teacher later on, but... Um, nice irony there, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> Great irony, that certainly is. I just hope to do a better job than some of my teachers. But, um, yeah, I went to a primary school and then on to a terrible thing called a public school in the UK, which, of course, isn't public at all, it's private. Yes. And um, it, it, it was a place where sport was king, yeah. And if you didn't uh, manage in rugby or cricket, then you were a second-class citizen. 
So I, I lived a great deal of my life as a second-class citizen. So you went into rugby and cricket, right? I, well, you can see I haven't changed much in size, so I wouldn't do very well in the front row, I'm afraid. <laughs> I see. So were school years unhappy for you? They were. I think looking back, you can see that things were a bit primitive. And um, I don't know if you've ever read uh, Lord of the Flies, but it was a little bit like the Lord of the Flies. So primitive in terms of harsh discipline and yes. um, yeah, not much uh, emotional intelligence and positive affirmation. You were... Not at all, except for one notable example. I must say, look, I must say I'm belying, maligning my... My, my master's, because it was a totally male environment. Was it a boys' school? Boys' school, right. boarding. The only woman we would see would be matron. Right. And, and that was just, that was virtually it. Um, and you would be um, shuttled from one class to the other with uh, teachers who came in their long black robes and so on. They didn't wear their mortar boards, yeah. but they were pretty well, that was that. And the prefects, of course, were really the gods of the place. They ruled with a, a, an iron fist. Most so, of the it, time. It, it was a tough world in those days. I mean, wartime rations, things were scarce, very strict school environment. Was the home environment strict as well? Were your parents? You know? No, no, not at all. I think. My mother was the more strict one. My father tried to pretend to be strict. And I think I've taken a lot of that on him because I'm a totally a total softy when it comes to discipline. You ask any of my pupils that I, I am just putty in their hands. And he tried to be a disciplinarian, but it was my mother, I think, who ruled the roost really. Okay, so the school years in the UK were tough. Did you you know, did you start to get a sense of what you wanted to do when you were going to leave school? Absolutely not. <laughs> I had the faintest idea what I wanted to do. And in fact, I think I only really found out what I wanted to do when I retired. But nevertheless, <laughs> I did my absolute best. And my dear father was so frustrated as well because he said he knew what he wanted to do by the time he was 15. Yeah. And it took me until the age of about 50 before I <laughs> sort of had seen <laughs> what was going on. But I think the world was much is much richer now with opportunities yeah. than it was in his day yeah. when it would just be before the, the Second World War. Yeah. But um, so no, I had no idea whatsoever wanted to, what I wanted to do. And what kind of kid were you at school? Were you shy? Were you outgoing? You, 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 you're very larger than life these days a lot of the time. Um, were you like that as a kid as well? And were you a good student? I mean, were you... No, I was a terrible student, I think, because I would sit at the back of the class if I could get to the back of the class mm. and generally drift off into my own world. There were once or twice, they used to have concerts at the end of the year yeah. or at the end of the Michaelmas term, the, the Christmas term, mm. occasionally. And myself and my study mate, when I got a bit older, we were allowed studies, you see. Mm. And so Tim, his name was Tim Davison, I would always put on an act at the end mm. of, uh, of the year. And I found that tremendous fun because although I couldn't get recognition from rugby or cricket, I could get a laugh now and again, mm. which was a great reward. Well, so that sort of thespian spirit was there quite early. You know, you liked performing, you liked being in front of people. It was about survival, actually, <laughs> because it was trying to do something to, to get yourself a place. So it wasn't look, it, it came out of a, a sense of desperation, oh. of trying somehow to get some recognition, <laughs> you know, when you were surrounded by strong willed people who would manage in all the, the yeah. major sports. Okay. So it was it around this time towards the end of your schooling when your family made the move to South Africa? Yes, yeah, so it was. So tell us about that. Why, why South Africa? You know, 
Yes, I, I, I wondered because it was what, 1961, 62, and South Africa had just been expelled from the Commonwealth, of course. And my father was headhunted to be director of research for Grant Mines, which was, of course, mm. Joburg based company. Yeah. And he and the, the rest of my family came over to South Africa, mm. and I was left in the UK for. Um, the final months of my schooling, of course, I was at boarding school, and then I came out to South Africa and landed from the Windsor Castle, uh, the ship at Cape Town, and saw the first sight of Table Mountain. Mm. And I realized at that moment that that was going to be home sometime. It wasn't home, of course, for many, many years, mm. but uh, we, it, it was later on it became. So you, you took the boat to, to Cape Town, but what, your, your father's job was in Johannesburg. So yes, that's right. So then you moved right. up to Johannesburg, and is that where you lived for a period of time? Yes, that's right. How long were you in Joburg for? Oh, several years. Um, while my, my parents died, of course, in the interim. Um, and uh, that was quite traumatic, I think. Well, it was very traumatic for my family when my mother was killed unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. Of course, she was in a car crash. And I think that had a uh, terrible effect on my sister. Um, mm -hmm. She was only 16, I think, at the time. Mm -hmm. And you and were, what, 19? I would be about 19, yes. Your mother died, okay. Yeah, but to me, you know, I sort of had that independence um, but it certainly made me grow up uh, very, very quickly. And uh, I think back now, I often have conversations with my sister and realize that there was absolutely no care given. You know, her mother had died at that terrible time, 16, when yeah. she was a young woman or becoming a young woman. And, and uh, Basically, the school said, well, you know, stiff up a lip and yeah. get over it. it, it uh, I think, thank goodness, I think we're far wiser when it comes to grieving today. As so our children in South Africa. Africa. In, yeah, in that was Africa. Yeah, yeah. And were both you and your sister still living with your parents at the time, and then, you know, obviously with your mum passing away, you were with just your father. Yeah. And mm -hmm. how, how did he cope with that? Well, I, not very well. Again, I think the process of grieving, I mean, we have in our church here, if I can refer to it, people like Peter Fox and, and other people who are experts in this and would make a far better job of counselling and so on. So men and women like him would have uh, been far better treated today than they were then. It yeah. was all a matter of, you know, character and so on, which was very tough. I, and I guess it. just coming out of war years, they were also exposed to a lot of death and, you know, maybe yes. it was less of a, uh, I don't know, surprising is the wrong word, but, you know, people were accustomed to death and, uh, and maybe I think that he was very lonely, as I can see, and he married again. Yes. Um, the, he, he died four years after, and this was something which I, now looking back at the time, I didn't realize it, but of course, linkage of grieving and cancer um, and the negative effects of depression mm -hmm. does make one liable to, to infection yes. and so on. And so that is something which wasn't really well known about then, yeah. but um, it does often happen. And as I say, he died at the age of 54, only well, four years old. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Ross, what did you do when you got to South Africa? You're 19 years old or you know, you've just finished schooling? Did you yeah. study in Did you get a job? Or what, did you study? What were you doing? I worked in the OK Bazaars, which not many people will remember. They'll probably be too young. But uh, the OK that you see now, the little corner shops, uh, it was not. It was the pick and pay, in fact. Uh, okay. That was the, the part of uh, the spectrum of commercial activity that uh, OK occupied yeah. and I, it didn't last very long. Okay. Eventually I managed to get into university and uh, I studied geography and geology. At which university? 
under the University of Vietnam's grant. Okay. But, yeah. Right. Okay. And did you did you enjoy your university days? Uh, I did, but I didn't work very hard <laughs> uh, on anything. But you managed to pass somehow. I, I got through eventually. Sometimes I wonder in those days whether they just didn't get fed up of seeing you around and eventually give you a mark here and a mark there to just ease you through the process. Um, and uh, so they eventually got me through and um, I went off uh, teaching geography, actually. I know my, my degree was in geography. And during university, were you staying in res? I mean, how did you manage to pay for your university fees? Was it free in those days? Had you been working? I mean, was your father yes. still alive by then? Well, then I was, for, my father died during the time I was at university, mm. but I was fortunate that, um, of course, his will was very generous and I was able to live off money that I'd inherited for quite a while. Right. So I managed to do honours in geography, which again was, um, I don't know if it was a triumph of intellect. I think it was more a working around things that we've got to move this guy on. <laughs> and lots of staff members gave me extra tips of what to do in yeah. the examination. <laughs> so I eventually got through that and spent uh, uh, a year teaching in Johannesburg, and then we, by then, uh, I had met my uh, wife, and we moved off into Botswana. Yeah, which was the start of a, a, a different adventure. And why geography? Was it because you have a sense you wanted to be a teacher and teach geography? I mean, geography never seems to be quite a career on its own. It's sort of people pick it out of interest uh, with a view to teaching it. it. Was that what was in your head? And, and as someone who hated school, some, was there a Damascus Road experience where I think maybe I want to be a teacher and spend my life in school? <laughs> yes, it, I, I think most people, when they hear the word geography, they don't think of it as being um, anything but something that you learn in school and then thankfully give it up. <laughs> you know, I, I, and I was trying to do, change this a little bit because I picked up a book for some reason while I was doing geology mm. and I carried on with my geology and did geography as my second major. Mm. So that was the, the first thing. And then I got to get very... The, the staff in the geography department were really tremendously friendly people. They weren't sort of like the ivory tower academics. And we went down caves and we went into rivers and we did all sorts of things and did surveys of Johannesburg on Sunday afternoons, you know, to see how the buildings were located. Uh, and it was fascinating. And I hope that some of my pupils later on actually at least got some of that enthusiasm for the subject yeah. when I when I taught it. Because I taught it for many years up to matric and, in fact, uh, marked papers and the whole thing. Ah. And how was it for you, you know, making the adjustment from growing up in the UK to suddenly living in South Africa, you know, a very different country, very different world, I imagine. I mean, was that a, a difficult transition? Well, if you knew that time when I came over here, I went from having to um, basically, uh, at my high school, having to do everything myself and do the washing up and so on and the cooking, and suddenly coming to South Africa, I mean, 1962, remember, was the time when anybody with a white skin could make it whatever. And I just enjoyed my privileged status tremendously. Um, I think that a few things did come in, and that was ended up with my wife then go, and I going to Botswana. Was the 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 attraction of moving into an educational situation? My wife was also a, a teacher, yeah. in which there was no um, question of segregation. Mm. Uh, there was an experiment going on. We were trying to work in a more natural environment. So this is when you moved to Botswana, 
you're teaching in a school in Haberoni and yeah. it, you're saying it was not segregated and not at all. Yeah. It was the thing was this that I think that the welcoming one got in Botswana was such that things happened and people got on with their lives. Mm. And there was, certainly wasn't the aggression, I hadn't mentioned that. Mm. I, I felt a tremendous amount of aggression, especially amongst the male, males in, in South Africa at the time. I think it's something we still suffer from, mm. is a great deal of unexpressed aggression for one reason or another. Often expressed given the, the pandemic of gender-based violence in this country, you know, it's, it, it yes. does come out. I think you'd find, although I didn't go into any depth, I think you'd probably find that the Motswana, I mean, it was a, a very much a mixed society. Um, you would find far more um, accepting and gentle mm. um, attitude. Generally, on, on the streets, mm. um, you know, they, there was one article in the local newspaper, which was really quite funny. You know, in Joburg, you're used to this bumper-bumper traffic and people getting aggressive and the traffic and so on. And there was a headline in the Botswana, the, the, the Botswana news, which said traffic on the increase and it had just two trucks at mm. a stop street mm. as, uh, as the, the picture. And, and that sort of quietness and I thought very gentle form of living was something which I would aspire to. So Ross, you, you've spoken about you know going to university and beginning this career in teaching, the Botswana experience, I assume, then coming back to South Africa. Mm. Um, but alongside that, you've also mentioned you you met Moira, I think you, you know, became your wife, mm. and then you had children. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes, certainly. Um, that certainly as being a new father, um, I think things happen so quickly, you know, and the Hollywood version of becoming a father is a little bit different to what actually happens. It's far messier, in fact, um, than, than the, the Hollywood version would uh, want to tell you. Because uh, uh, obviously it was our first child, we neither of us had experience of what was going to happen. And uh, I remember waking up at half past five in the morning and uh, uh, Moira saying to me, I think things are happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, phoning up the uh, pediatrician and the guy who was going to be present at the birth, and him just saying in a very Afrikaans accent, Yeah, man, on your way. <laughs> so we then went off to the hospital, fortunately early in the morning, so no panics about traffic or anything. We got there. And um, you know, quite shortly after that, uh, Timothy Conrad Metcalf <laughs> appeared to the world. Wonderful. Yeah. And then you have a second son as well? That's right, yes. And he arrived when I was uh, a deputy at Alberton High School, still in Johannesburg. Right. And um, that was, of course, very important as far as the school was concerned. Um, and I remember having been told by an all-girls class that I had, mm. when is your child, when is the baby going to come round? Mm. And um, I think they managed to take up four geography periods plus break. So we basically had no lessons between sort of just before first break and lunchtime mm. when uh, the offspring were being handed around to all the people <laughs> in the class. Yeah, so they made a first appearance um, at my school mm. and I think they were somewhat more popular than I was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for how long were you teaching in Joburg? And, uh, you know, I, I gather at some point you also made your way down here to Cape Town. How did, how did that come to pass? Yeah, I, I mean, we'd had some things that happened, um, uh, a few things where I'd come into contact with some of the rather right-wing uh, tendencies from Pretoria, um, and there was definitely a few cracks showing 
Um, and I realized that although I might want to be a headmaster, I, I didn't know if that was for me. Yeah. And um, uh, I would have done a training course in television. And um, so there was a post going here in the Ace from Fifty and Wardek as the House of Representatives here in the Cape and the old tricameral com government, you see. And so I arrived here um, to take over the television studio and it, it was very different to the television of today. It was all analog material and so on and great big thick uh, tape that went from one reel to the other and so on. So that's a big shift from teaching, Ross. So can you help us understand that a bit more? So you, you're teaching geography, but yes. this interest in television was emerging. And uh, like we're talking behind the camera, in front of the camera, in production, what? Yes, what? everywhere. I developed an interest because I'd done a course of VITS, just a week course, that's all. It wasn't anything special. And I realized that there was a lot going on and perhaps this could be important in education. And there were people using videotape uh, quite a lot and it was quite becoming more and more effective, I feel. Mm. So that sparked my interest. And then I decided to do uh, a degree at UNISA in communication, specializing in television and mm. so on. Um, you were doing this part-time while you were still teaching? Yes. And I'm fathering. <laughs> but it, it was a bit of a rush at times, <laughs> yes. Um, and sort of learning how to try and memorize things was quite something. So I was doing this at the same time. I spent a few times going over to the UK as well and uh, was tagged on to film crews at Granada Television. Yeah. And, and so I was picking stuff up wherever I could, in front of the camera, behind the camera, doing the lights, trying to do um, the sound as well. Mm. And um, so in many cases, we did manage to get things done. And we generally worked, though, for the people who were the inspectorate. So mm. we'd try and make a little movie so that they could take that to, mm. the, the, to show the teachers what they were wanting. Mm. So we did demo lessons and uh, various uh, programs that, that helped, I hope. So that's a big shift. You, were, you, you're teaching in Johannesburg, maybe could have been a headmaster, decided that wasn't for you, rather move to Cape Town, take up a role with government in television production. Yes. So, and, uh, wow, that's quite something. And um, how was the move to Cape Town? And, you know, did, did, did the move into television pay off? Uh, was it something you enjoyed? It, I enjoyed the job, but there was a lot of politics in it. I think a lot of people were in a position where they were extremely insecure. Yeah. Um, one minister of education, actually, his secretary, who is a gentleman, phoned me and said, you will produce a television camera for the minister and also a television and a playback unit. It was sort of a, a, an order. Yeah. So eventually I took the, the equipment over to the minister who be, who spent a couple of years in jail, by the way, but we won't go up that. <laughs> it was later found with 24 um, uh, computers in his garage. Hmm. Um, I'm not quite sure where they were going to go to, but I don't think they were due to go to school. Anyway, he got two years in jail. And uh, that was my experience of certain things which happened which shouldn't have perhaps happened. So with the move to Cape Town, is that when you first came into contact with IUC? Yes, 1985. Right. Mm. And how did that come about? That was a friend of ours called Cindy Lou Schmidt. Cindy Lou died tragically um, a few years ago, but she was a Sunday school teacher here. Mm. And she said, you must come along and meet Doug Bax, who was then the minister. Mm. And so, of course, Doug, as you know, is a, a real character. And um, 
he was, uh, of course, in the midst of everything from, what was it, the campaign to stop young men going into the army. There was a lot going on. And I basically came in and saw the likes of, um, who was it? I think that David Harrison was then at the forefront of uh, that movement. And there were others as well. Fiona McLennan, I think. Sorry? Fiona McLennan, I think. Yes, yes. Yeah. There were a number of people who were then, uh, then... And I also enjoyed tremendously the trips, which I think David and a few other people organised uh, to go down the Fish River and various yeah. things. So we had a tremendous social life here as well as the, the church itself. Mm. And the kids were growing up, I assume, and were they part of the, the church here as well, your family? My sons um, were actually in the building opposite to this one. They were um, at the Catholic school, right. St. David's, yeah. um, or St. Joseph's, sorry, St. Yeah. Joseph's, um, and the Maris Brothers. Uh, and so they were there, and they did attend Sunday school mm. here for a while, yes. Okay. But then you found your way back to the UK. Yes. And how did that come about? Well, unfortunately, because of the breakup of my marriage, um, I was left uh, in, a, in a position where I realised that money-wise I had to earn some money. Mm. So the initial thing was to... Um, uh, to get over to the UK for a year and um, I was given a, a, a really nice send-off here, especially uh, by Reg and Sue Smith, mm. who made a big fuss of me and said, look, uh, we'll meet you over there, we'll often come over and we'll get together. And they, true to their word, they uh, had a marvellous bry place and I saw everybody and said goodbye, hoping that I would be back in a year. Mm. It wasn't to be the case, but I did join a school which um, was a great influence on me called uh, the Sybil Elgar School for children with autism mm. and extreme learning difficulties. a totally different thing for me. And yet we had some very wise people there and I might add an extremely high budget for each child, as you can imagine, in the UK, that sort of money is available. So you went back to teach at that school? I went to teaching, yes, yes. And, and where was the school? That was in Southall in London. Right, OK. Yeah. So you went back to live in London, thinking at the time it would be for one year, but how long would it actually turn out to be? Twelve. <laughs> Wow, that's quite a long time. Did you, so did you spend all those 12 years teaching at that school or doing other things? No, well? I didn't. Uh, to be frank, I think I, got, I was getting old, actually. Uh, and, um, and the staff, I think, were very good to me. Um, it's a young man or young woman's job. Yeah. Uh, you have got to be on the ball for every second of the day mm. um, because the children are very vulnerable indeed. Mm. And the staff as well uh, can easily, um, you know, suffer an injury because they're concentrating. A child, yeah. you know, could have a bad day and come and hit you. Um, they yeah. have no, you know, it, it's not uh, any way uh, a nastiness in the children. It's just that that's the way they are. And one learns very, very fast. Well, after eight years, I thought, hmm, this is, you know, it, I'm getting tired mm -hmm. um, and uh, need to move on. So I started a um, tutorial franchise, actually, um, which was very successful, and I had teachers working for us. And then after four years, I still wanted to come back to South Africa. And um, so I managed to sell the business, uh, and then I was on the flight to Cape Town. I was going to ask you about that, Ross. You know, where where was home? Did you have have a sense of that? You know, you were born in the UK, mm -hmm. lived for many years, came here, but then went back to the UK. You know, when life was in a little bit of a crisis, the pull of home, maybe, but. 
you know, was it just an economic pull or did you, you know, when you're back in the UK for 12 years, did you feel like that's home or you still have this yearning for South Africa? I, again, I think I'm a late developer or something because <laughs> I never had this feeling of home until I came back here at the ripe old age of, what, about 67 or something like that. Right. And then I really felt that I put my roots down in Thornton. You know? mm. And perhaps some of it is due to my brilliant builder, Paul Carter, who has built with me everything from a tree house through to knocking down my house and making it into four flats, one of which I occupy, and then I've got three very... Um, very nice tenants who are there as well. So maybe it's a physical thing that the bricks and mortar of my home have now mm. spoken to me and said, listen, now this is home, stay here. Mm. And I feel a sense of belonging. I don't know if I ever did before then, you know. Um, I certainly wouldn't think of the UK as being my home, although much of the culture and the accent I have and so on comes from there. But I feel like I belong here. So bad luck, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that must have been a tough period for you, break up of marriage, going back to the UK on your own, mm. staying there for 12 years, living in London, I assume, teaching in London. You know, was that a tough period or was it a sort of, you know, you managed to find yourself again and um, but still this pull of South Africa? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm blessed wherever I go because the thing with being depressed in a small town in the UK um, was perhaps could have happened, but people at the church I belonged to then said, hey, you come along, we need you in the, the drama department. Mm. And I eventually... I mean, I had such support uh, when we were doing plays, usually C.S. Lewis type of plays, mm. that they supported me even when I lost my words in, in the whole thing. Yeah. So, Ross, I mean, this, uh, this sort of acting, performing mm. uh, love and talent that you have, I mean, you said that started at school almost in desperation because you weren't into rugby and cricket and yes. a way of being noticed. But has yes. this is sort of carried on all through your life? Have you done, you know, been in plays and dramas all throughout and, and, and sort of in amateur production companies or doing it as part of church? Just tell us a little bit about your... Yes, I think certainly when I came here, Peter Crummock, mm. who, who died sadly a few years ago, mm. when Peter passed on when 2013, um, I did a production here with him, something he'd written. I recall, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that I enjoyed. I'm, uh, and if something comes up again, I'm all for it. Mm. I enjoy it. Yeah, but you've had a history of doing that all through your life, have you? you know, yeah, it's, in the UK, you were acting as well, and yes, but I'm not a, a a mainstream sort of leader in that sort of thing. Yeah. People have to tell me what to do. I'm more a foot soldier, you know, <laughs> not a leader or somebody who will come up and get inspired. Right. I just enjoy being part of the team. Yeah. So that's really where I sort of stand back before somebody's going to say to me, now you better you yeah. know, start a drama department or something like that. So coming back to South Africa, uh, after 12 years in the UK, for four years you developed your yep. tutoring business mm. and was well, it definitely Cape Town to come back to, not Johannesburg and... Oh, yes, Cape Town. Because... And what was it about Cape Town? Was it your roots here at RUC? Was it other friends? You know, what? what? Well, certainly, um, uh, uh, Christopher, my youngest son, and his husband, Philip, they, they're here. Yeah. And Tim and Michelle, so that's my son, Tim, the elder one, and Michelle in Italy. Mm. And um, I'd love to visit them. But there's, uh, they're here. Uh, so that was important for me. And also the fact that I've got a group of friends here, people who tolerate me and are able to manage my whatever I do. Um, so th this was home. And, I mean, one can't get away from the 
the beauty of the place, the physical beauty yeah. and the fact that it's there. Even if you maybe don't go to the beach for six months, yeah. you know it's there. You can go there yeah. if you need to. Yeah. So that's a tremendous attraction. Yeah. So since coming back to Cape Town, um, you know, you you said you came as, a, as an older man. You were 67 or something, but... I was 67 then. I'm not 67 no, anymore. I understand that, Ross. Mm. But I'm just saying, you know... Some people at 67 might have pulled up stumps and retired, but you, you, you kept working and my understanding is, you know, the tutoring business that you do in the UK, you were doing similar kind of work here. Can you tell us a little bit about, bit more about, you know, what you've done professionally, if you like, since you've been back in Cape Town the second time? Yes, things have moved on. Um, I still do a bit of tutoring. I'm teaching maths and physical science, mm. which, as I've said to some of my students, I've said, look, I am a bit of a fraud. You know, my qualification is in geography, <laughs> not in physical science. Mm. And they've kept faith with me and I've sort of kept one page ahead of them in the textbook. Um, <laughs> and I've thoroughly enjoyed it, you know, the times when one suddenly discovers something and the logic of the maths and the adventure of the, the physical science are still something I enjoy. Uh, so I'm still doing some of that teaching, just individually. But then I'm finding a new life over in Maconi Primary School in Langa. Mm. And Maconi is actually very close to Pinelands. You can actually see it. It's virtually on the border there. And I've ridden past it, goodness knows how many times. And then a friend of mine, Sevewe, said to me, I need you for maths. So, mm. okie dokie, I'll start with the maths. Cut a long story short, I do maths and English now on Mondays and Wednesdays with a team of other teachers. Mm. And we have a marvellous time. We really do. I mean, even going back to, to marching, I can't believe it that we know my old school, we used to march like little soldiers and so on. Yes. And these kids, I had suddenly, for some reason, we said, right, we're going to get from here to there. And I thought, right, let's try and do some marching. Mm. And their rhythm and everything was fantastic. And for some reason, they started saluting as well. <laughs> so we've got a little army going there backwards and forwards. I don't know if they keep left, right, left, right, but they're pretty good. Mm. Wonderful. So um, is the worth word, you know, retirement uh, in your lexicon, Ross? You know, if, will it come a day when actually... I, yeah, I, I think that, that would not be something I'd want to do. Um, <laughs> because a little bit on sitting on the beach or going to the Bahamas or something, it does have a certain ring to it, a certain amount of attraction, but not much, you know. <laughs> it, it, boredom is a terrible thing, yeah. a terrible thing. It really is. And um, I'm not into that. I'll leave that to teenagers and people <laughs> in their early 20s. So while the, the body and mind is still able, you would rather keep working and, uh, and, and interacting with kids because it must be, you know, you have a genuine love for working with children. Is, is that a fair comment? Yes, little children, yeah. not the sort of whatever type of teenagers. <laughs> no, I, I realised that was a mistake uh, for far too late, really. The little people in grade four and grade two, I enjoy. And what we had as well, which is unfortunate, it's, it's discontinued, and yet I'm hoping that we'll maybe get something happening, was at Red Cross Children's Hospital, we we're doing storytelling. Mm. And the storytelling we do online now, um, we can't obviously go to the hospital um, because of the restrictions they put into place there. Mm. But one hopes they will see the light and manage to realize that there is a need for this. But we are online um, and doing stories. Well, I do them on a Friday, but uh, we used to do them on a Monday, Wednesday and Friday. So I'm hoping to expand that a bit myself. But there are quite a number of storytellers now. Mm. But I hope now we're at the moment of the recording of this program, we're on level one. I'm hoping we'll get back to the so-called new normal and we'll be able to go in and uh, mm. do what we did before the lockdown. Mm. So here's hoping. And Ross, I mean, 
what are your other interests, hobbies in life? You know, you, you, you have a weekend off. What, what would you want to do? You know, what, what, what does fun look like for you? Well, normally whenever my dog sees that I have, you know, the a, a pupil has left or something, then she realizes it's time for a walk. Mm. So that actually a small thing, but it's enjoyable. And of course, gardening is mm. enjoyable. I'm doing some gardening that, uh, at O'Moolin. O um, down here, the the eco village, mm. um, and that's enjoyable as well because that ground is very fertile, mm. and you can grow spinach and you can grow potatoes and goodness knows what else. Which in my home in Saunton is is quite a mission. Mm. Uh, the difference in soils, but I'm enjoying gardening. It's maybe going back to my grandfather's days when he was a mixed farmer in Yorkshire. Mm. In fact, some of those genes have seeped into me somewhere. <laughs> um, I don't know, but certainly, yeah, I enjoy that. Um, I really do. Mm. Well, it's been great to have you as part of the IEC community here, uh, and I know you sort of play different roles here, and I'm just interested to hear, you know, has faith been part of your life ever since a child were you raised at, uh, in a church environment you know and uh, uh, what what part has that played you know I guess as you've gone through different seasons of life and mm. you know, ups and downs and crises and moving from one continent to the other and back you know yes uh, has, has that been a constant for you it's it's been it's a strange thing but I know I wasn't brought up in a, a, a family that had any faith in particular. No, they, they didn't. Um, and yet when I arrived in South Africa, one of the people who made me start to confront what I was meant to do, what life was about, what I was here for, was a guy called Brian Brown, who unfortunately came adrift as far as the authorities were concerned. And he now is back in England. He's an old man now, but he's still, he was here part of the anti-apartheid movement. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't only politically that Brian had an influence on me, but also in terms of faith and the questioning mm -hmm. of faith, the continual questioning, because I'm one of these doubters who recognizes the incredible power and importance of the Christian faith and how important that is. But could I be a minister? I couldn't, <laughs> because I wouldn't be able to say with conviction, this is truth and that is not truth. <laughs> um, and I think that's, and, and I say that in all honesty, without it being something that I worries me. <laughs> I just feel that I will carry on being a, a listener and a doubter and a questioner for the rest of my life. I'm certainly not an academic, by the way. <laughs> I don't think I could aspire to that. Is it part of the attraction of IUC that, you know, it, it, it is a community that does allow for questioning and doubts and, you know, we have lots of people who would probably profess and espouse different nuances of faith or, yes. or, or, or unfaith, you know, but... Uh, you know, what, what is it that drew you to this community and, but, and keeps you as part of it? Yes, it's actually, um, yeah, well, it's your fault, actually, <laughs> because I've always been an admirer of um, the programs that you had on Sunday evening here, and although there was controversy, that was the nature of um, the, the RUC beast, if I may call it that, yeah. um, is that it, it lives on controversy because it has more professors and doctors per square meter than any <laughs> other institution I know. Yeah, and true. so lifeblood is that. So I'm going to challenge you, perhaps, the, you and Selena could perhaps reintroduce that at some time, if you can manage the controversy that will go with it, I'm sure. I, I've had many uh, enjoyable times with those Sunday evenings. I think they were a very important thing. Thank yeah. you, I think just my final question might be to ask you as an educator to reflect a little bit on, you know, the situation in South Africa. Obviously, you know, with South Africa's huge history of inequality, you know, Mandela would say the way forward is education, education, education. That's their only chance to 
you know, to bring about some measure of justice and equality by giving you know young people the chance to learn. You know, you've worked with many, many young people in South Africa over the years, and I assume you know people of all races. And mm. what's your sense of where we are today? And you know, do you have any? Um, advice or <laughs> comments on you know where we are in terms of that yes I, what I would say is first of all it comes from a position of complete irresponsibility because I don't have to be responsible for carrying out the things my pipe dreams but I would actually having very much been against it at one time uh, when I heard about it from friends in the United States would be busing. I don't see why we can't take children from a high school which has had a history of high privilege and tremendous amount of money in the actual materials that are there, not never mind the teachers who are there, um, to take them to a place like the primary school I'm working in at the moment, Makoni, um, and just letting them have a taste and so creating a relationship. There are tremendous problems with that, not just in the sheer movement of children, but the prejudices which lie within most of us. But this isn't going to be an easy period. I think when in uh, 1994, uh, been, since then, there have been many times when people have thought that this was the nation uh, that could show the world how to behave and it had a constitution which was second to none. Bearing in mind that birth is an extremely painful um, process and the fact that we're going through difficulties now is part of the process. Uh, there's no ways in which we can expect it not to be painful. But I do feel as though we're not progressing at the rate we could. And I think there's a lot of reticence on the behalf of us people who are privileged who are not allowing more to happen in places which are not so privileged. And it can happen, I mean, within my own community. We're just five minutes drive from Langa, mm. and we could be doing something there and starting mm. to, to work. And um, there are little minds there that are waiting for uh, educators, teachers to come in to their midst and, and they will accept that tremendously and benefit. Mm -hmm. So I want to think in terms of changing things now, not for change that will happen tomorrow, but which will happen in the years to come. Mm -hmm. So money, definitely. Uh, teachers who could well be seconded um, to other places and in turn could come. So, you know, some of my colleagues at Maconi could easily pop across to the Red School in Pinelands. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't take a tremendous amount of effort to cause that to happen. Mm -hmm. And we could do that. And of course, there must be, uh, in terms of the budget on education, I think it's beginning to happen, but there needs to be a tremendous amount more spent, uh, certainly on the schools that I have visited in Langa. And I would imagine the same is true in other schools. So, yeah, a lot to be done, but certainly not, oh, the country's going to the dogs. Otherwise, I'd never come back. Mm. No, it, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, how can I put it? Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about what the future holds. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Ross. It's been great to hear more of your story and uh, to get a sense of your interests and passions. So thank you so much for sharing all that with us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.